Okay, Nigel. Could you say just a little bit about um, you know wh how you see um, your support, which has been now over several years, nearly ten years now, nearly ten, mm -hmm. uh, for the Conversation Cafe? What did you say just yeah. a little about it? Well, it started from an idea that was raised when I was doing a masters at UWE and uh, a Conversation Cafe based on Rural Cafe, and. Um, it was really talking to people, Marie, Chris and so on, about how we can actually start thinking about how we improve our practice by those conversations that take place and important ones that happen outside of training events, the ones that happen at uh, the coffee breaks and so on there. Um, and it's then really trying to, um, for my own practice, looking at the values, the basis of, what we, of how I make decisions as a leader um, and keep on coming back to those values and why am I making those decisions? Um, and that then led me to thinking about um, a yeah, learning organisation and how I can actually use that in a learning organisation. Wider than that is actually trying to support others in looking at their practice and their own research uh, and looking at how they might improve things uh, for them. Most people are working with vulnerable children or vulnerable adults as well um, so it's actually about how we do that in a very complex psychosocial sort of uh, environment. That's great. I've got something. I've got something. I've got you didn't paid any more for it. Can we, can we go around? This, what do you want to do, Chef? All yeah, well, it is, what I said last week, which is, um, it's basically, as we're talking, uh, there's a lot happens in the conversations, you know, that there's a definite community feel about our response to each other's inquiries. And, and as we're going, many of us are going up to Liverpool Hope, and we've already produced uh, 2,000 words and sent them off. Have you, Chris? More than 1,000. Yeah, okay, 1,000. <laughs> but it's... it's yeah. yeah, it's just to get that sense of, of a, a, you know, it's an evolving conversation, and there are particular moments like this this week, where we've actually, many of us have got documents that we're putting in the public domain and just sharing. And what you were saying, Julie, last week, you know, you didn't know what you had. And I was saying, well, in that relationship with William and helping him to express what he was doing, that's a really important value. So it's just going around as we usually do. Are you okay? Or do you want to ask questions? Let's shut you up. This is like <laughs> rabbits in the in the <laughs> <laughs> it's just that normal catch up with well, what you're doing. Do okay. <laughs> Go on. Why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll start. Um, uh, what I've been working on, and most of you know, the last five weeks, is um, responses to invitations in different parts of the world, like uh, five uh, days in Thailand for a workshop, um, over to Mauritius where I gave a keynote for Microsoft seminar. And then, the most exciting stuff, in Israel, with a keynote to an international conference on teacher education, and also uh, at Abraham College, where one of my former AD students, Anat Geller, is lecturing. And I gave two videotaped presentations on living theory, um, on what it was, living educational theory, and the other one, multimedia narrative. Now, it's part of my intention to try to spread the influence of living theories, literally within as many social formations around the world as I possibly can. So my intention in doing all that is to try to take values that I believe, and I hope others do, carry hope for the future of humanity and spread those through enabling people to develop their own accounts of their own inquiries as they try to improve their practice. Does that make sense in terms of what I've been trying to do? Yes. And why I enjoy coming here is that you evoke in me, as you talk about what you're doing, your energy, I find life affirming, as I love the ideas that you're developing. And this, if you like, is part of a social formation, like the Nigel, Chris, Marie, beginning these conversation cafes about 10 years ago, that is part of me trying to sustain that commitment to developing these values and understandings. So, so that is what I see myself doing. Okay? Good. Don't look so shell shocked. <laughs> 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 That's so, how are you measuring this? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> now, that, do you know, if you talk about measurement, right? Why I love those questions is that I can respond, well, actually, I, I don't tend to measure because to measure something, I think you need the interval or ratio of the scale. And this kind of data it isn't appropriate with that measurement. But I can evaluate my influence by um, enabling, for example, or supporting everybody here to bring your own accounts of your life and your influences and share them in the public domain. And if you find some of my ideas useful, like, for example, with the video, or you find that that sense of embodied values in the actual inquiry process you're, you're using and you acknowledge that influence, that is my evidence that I'm having some influence uh, in that wider world. So, I, you know, those questions of the measurement and evaluation yeah. are really crucial. Yeah. Okay, are you okay to go around, Nigel? Yeah. Well, I've... Um produced a paper for Joan, and it all fits in with me trying to, or promising, which is a nice, nice thing to do, but to get some, get the first draft of my, my thesis together by mid-September, by the time we go back up. So, in doing that, it's also thinking about, you know, the methodology, the philosophy behind it, how is it all working, so, so that was a sort of contribution to, to, to my thesis, and just making me think about things as well. But, and it was around third person and first person research. And I was listening to the radio yesterday and there was a, a programme about, and I can't remember what they call it, but a sort of a, a Toma, a sort of Jewish um, study group. And I have real parallels with uh, Conversation Cafe, although they seem to do it a bit more intensively because some people go to this group every day for 40 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and they just take uh, bits of the, um, the Torah, etc., and they debate them and debate them and debate them. And it is, you know, the, the way in which they're um, uh, seeing it is sort of like conversation with God around, you know, what the meanings of, the, of, of, of these things are. Um, <clears throat> and there was one little bit in there, and the guy said to me, Can you tell me what, um, what uh, the tone was all about? And he said, Let me tell you a story. He said, There's two men come down a chimney. He said, in, uh, one comes out clean, one comes out dirty. Um, which one washes himself? And the guy said, uh, well, the one that came out dirty. He said, no, 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 no. He said, they both look at each other, and the, the, the clean one thinks he's dirty, and the dirty one thinks he's clean, and so it's the clean one that goes and washes himself. So he said, oh, right, I get it. And he said, well, let me tell you another story. He said, two men come down the chimney, and uh, uh, one comes out clean, one comes out dirty. And he said, which one washing himself? He said, we just told me the answer. He said, uh, no, 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 no. He said, but uh, it, they, they both look at themselves and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm dirty and I'm clean. So the dirty one washes. And he said, oh, right, right, I see it now. So I'm thinking first person, third person, sort of you know, looking at yourself as well as looking at other people. Now. And he said, right, let me tell you a story. He said, two people come down the chimney. Um, one comes out dirty, one comes out d dirty. He said, which one? He said, I'm really confused now. Uh, and he said, because you just told me that it's, it's that way. He said, but you've got to realise that why would anybody come out clean now coming out of the chimney? <laughs> <laughs> <of a> chimney? <laughs> and I thought, there's just so many little parallels you know, with this sort of conversation oh, between first and, and third person yeah, type yeah. of research. Like looking at others and, and you know, seeing yourself in them and then looking at yourself and so on. So that was sort of like it, a bit exciting. It was on yesterday, you probably get on catch up if you were. Yeah. It was a bit, I don't know what the name of the programme was, I sort of caught it out. <coughs> but it was something about the Toma. Talmud. 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 It's really the Talmud. So it was 10 o'clock because I was going to Bristol. Right. Yesterday I'm only four. Happy morning worship. No, it wasn't a worship, it was a. It was sort of like. Yeah, let's see. Just a sort of documentary type of thing, really. But it's found it interesting. Yeah, it's great. In fact, they do this for 40 years. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, Chris. Mm. Well, well, I can't quite follow that. <laughs> but I'm in the middle of doing a paper, and um, it's on self-study and why I'm doing um, self-study. And, um, you know, I have spoken about this uh, before. You know, I sort of have felt quite vulnerable you know, at times in doing a self-study, and particularly in the beginning when I first uh, started doing my dissertation. 
and uh, felt very vulnerable in that you sort of open yourself up and you expose yourself, you know, when you talk about your values. I mean, now I find it very, very easy to do. But in the beginning, I didn't find it easy at, at all, very, very difficult. And I feel that, um, you know, besides these, these feelings of being vulnerable, I feel that, you know, you, you're taking risks as well, you're taking personal risks as well. Um, and personal. So I'm sort of reading around this at the moment, but one of the things that I have said in my paper is what has really, really helped me in, address, in, in doing this and presenting um, my papers and so on is coming to Conversation Cafe and being a part of a very supportive group whereby there's that feeling of trust. Um, and I have been, I felt that I've been able to you know bring my papers and, and to talk openly with people knowing that it's a very sort of safe a safe space then okay so that's what sort of I've been writing about at the moment so um, I'm just hoping I can get it finished so yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so I'm still coming to some sort of understanding about all of this really um, I read all the papers that were put on I think on that one, you know, you're going up to hope. Um, I've read those papers and they were, they were, I suppose it's just got getting me thinking really and some of the things I can identify with, some things they don't quite sort of fit just yet but, you know, I'm still open to it, I'm still sort of reading around it so I'm still learning I suppose really. Could you just tell a little bit about what it is that you've been doing? Um, well, actually doing that piece about values that I wrote, that, that was the first time I think anybody's ever asked me about my values. I've, nobody's ever even asked me that question. If somebody said to me, what's important to you, I would have been able to probably say the same sort of thing. But actually, I think since I've written that, well, I've asked a lot of those things I aspire to. I know a lot of the time, you know, I don't achieve, I mean, I, I said I think I wrote that I, I like honesty and I like equality. I know there's times in my life when I haven't been able to live up to those values, so... I suppose it's just got me thinking a bit more. Yeah. Okay. So nothing's clear, really. It's just, just evolving. Okay. So. Well, I think that's how it is, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Um, it's a serious problem. Yes. Yes, it was really good uh, last weekend. I was actually camping. I actually wrote my paper while, whilst camping, I have to say. Well, not, not. I, I, I enjoyed myself and the barbecues and stuff. I wasn't writing that paper all the time. I suppose that's why it's reasonably short. Um, but actually, I, I could uh, relate to what uh, Nigel was saying. Is, is that thing about it needs to make sense? So that question about, well, how people come out of the chimney, not dirty. You know, and I think that's the real thing about research practitioners. It has to make sense in practice. And that, to me, is really, is really important. Because otherwise, it's just like... How is that possible if it doesn't actually make sense or you know whatever? Um, yeah, but I actually really enjoy doing it. I know it's very short. I, I kind of um, what did I did say to you? I think it was to you um, uh, that I almost didn't say it. I kind of thought, oh gosh, you know, it needs more work. Um, it's not quite right. It's, it's you know very short and simple, and I haven't had time to do it, you know, as I would like to. But I just thought, oh, I'll just do it anyway because I knew I wasn't going to have time anyway. I'll hopefully work more on it later on. Um, but yes, I think it's just, I think it's that thing as well that I'm trying to do, is trying to make it simple. Because I, I agree, I, I find it quite difficult sometimes to understand some of the stuff. And I, I want to understand it and then make it really simple so that I can influence like others uh, <coughs> and, and so on in wanting to do it too. And I know that, you know, if I just go in, in Portugal, people sometimes do that. They use very, you know, complicated language. You know, it looks very clever, but actually, you know, what does it mean? So I don't mind using the complicated words, but then I like to um, explain what, what they are. And in this paper, I didn't use any complicated words yet. <laughs> so, you know, but it's it's like, I don't know, it's like, what is this like for me? So anyway, thanks for everybody who um, commented. That was very helpful. Um, yeah, I just, I mean, I started, I wanted to start with a kind of a, <coughs> an example in a way that's happened this week of um, my photographic exhibition, which happened for a day, lots of people saw it, but lots of people didn't, wanting that to go further and wanting the message of the exhibition, which I feel is within it, to go further. Uh, and being invited last week um, by this council, who haven't seen it, the Equalities team, um, to have it as the display in the foyer of City Hall 
for um, Black History Month in October, which is fantastic. So I had to ring up the guy and talk to him about it. And I'm not going to be at all critical of him, but you could see that what he wanted was photographs of black people to put in the foyer on black history, <laughs> which he'd been told are really good. And that would tick his box for having an exhibition in the foyer. Uh, and that was great, because that was us and we were going to be there. So he was saying, right, okay, we'll get in touch with the, uh, the person who organises the display. Get me. And he was like, you could see there was a sort of busyness about the way he was speaking. And being the sort of person that I am, I said, so I just wanted to say a little bit about the exhibition. So I told him, I said, there are captions underneath each picture. Um, and this is the date they came to the UK, and this is how many children, um, grandchildren they have. And the more I put the sort of um, the icing on the cake, if you like, um, he, he got more and more excited and interested and said, um, well, actually, there's going, to be, uh, there's going to be an award. He said, I think, you know, you'd probably be nominated for an award and get some funding um, if, if you were successful with the award. But it was just that thing about, you know, that my base of saying that is that you have this product which, we, which so often happens, which somebody says, oh, yeah, that's good, that, stick that in there, that'll work. Um, but actually by enhancing that and by actually getting the deeper meaning, and he is the equalities person for the council, um, he, he got it without actually, you know, he hasn't seen the exhibition. I sent him some photos of, of people wandering around the exhibition, but he hasn't seen the pictures yet. Um, but I was able to get him excited, and he now wants to have it in the leaflet that goes with the, um, the, the, um, the Black History Month. So he's getting the person who's going to be producing that to come and see me. And then I've had this idea of had a reporter um, who's been doing um, life story work with some of the people. We didn't really know what to do with it. So we're going to produce a publication of that, which will probably only go on our website um, for Black History Month. So suddenly there's just this kind of, you know, it's drawing in and we've got a focus. And about writing the, the piece, um, it, it, I found, I started off thinking I had a clue what's being asked here and I don't understand and I should just give up because if I don't understand this, then I don't. Um, and, uh, and then I just kept reading it and reading it and just started um, and found it hugely beneficial for myself to start to see, and, and it is very much um, an angle on it, and it's about academic versus practitioner. And it's like the practitioners all come in nervously, and I was just I was thinking about analogies to it, the, like little, you know, little ballet dancers who come in not knowing how to do a single step to these people who've got huge amounts of steps and style and know exactly how to do it. And that sort of tentative from actually sort of being clumsy to actually learning from the, those who understand um, the academic language, when you start to then use it yourself and you start to become one of those people that other people come in and go, does that work me? Um, and it, is, it feels like that process. And I think that's very simplistic, but that's how it feels at the moment. And my whole angst about practitioners not being heard because the academics are, you know, we're in the way of them studying it and finding out for themselves what we already know because we're doing it. So that's that's great. Well, when thing. is that? Uh, when is the in October? You said. Have you got a date for it? The that? whole it's, it's a national Black History Month is every October for the whole month. So it's the whole month. So if we have dates where some of us might go. Yeah, yeah, we're on, it's on the last week, the Monday to Friday, right. which ends on 1st of November. Okay. It'll be in the foyer. Right. Yeah. And it might be possible to have you there. You know, we could video perhaps you yeah, there, um, you know, speaking about it. As, yes. Okay. Yes. Be great. Sorry, mm -hmm. just sort of interested in, it starts from a little germ of an idea, doesn't it? And it gets bigger and bigger. And mm -hmm. you'd be interested in sort of how, how you know, the sort of influence of yeah, now in the, in the city hall, yes. you know, potentially you know, thousands of people yes. seeing this yes. and so on. So yes. that's a good thing. I know it's true, but can I just kind of add a little thing? I like what you said about the ballet, but actually I think the practitioners are the ones dancing and maybe sort of, you know, a bit nervous about the dancing. And maybe the academics are the ones judging the dancing, but then, you know, they don't often know how to do it. So it's that kind of explanation of how you dance when actually dancing is a thing as well. But sometimes when you dance, you find it difficult. So what you do actually, because you've got the sensation of the movement, but you may find it difficult to explain how you do it. That's, that's how I would probably feel. That was like that. No, no, that, that's very important, <laughs> I think, because this point about uh, your embodied knowledge is really vital <coughs> to, you know, that's the dancing. We need to find the appropriate ways of making that public. You know, and I, I think we're getting much closer now, Sheila. I think 
think that was with the excitement. Maybe it's we have to call it ballet and <laughs> we're wanting to call it, you know, ping pong. You know what I mean? It's like we're, we're doing ping pong, but the academics say, in ball. order for yes. it to become ballet, you need to actually point your toes more. You know, it's, it's that, isn't it? You know, we're, sort of, we're doing these fabulous free things that, you know, haven't got a name. No, no, you want to do ballet. You just jolly well point your toes. Yeah. <laughs> do you think that there's an academic name, meta ballet? <laughs> Um, well, this week I'm excited about my reconnection with my Constellations work because I've been a little bit, don't know if I can get started on this, don't know if I need more training, how do I go about it? And um, yesterday I had a conversation with a lady that I've been getting to know and I'm going to join a Constellations peer group which gives me a support group to practising and also... Um, they haven't got much experience of organisational work, but they've got a lot of experience of family work. And um, she was explaining the two, two separate things that came up in connection with it. One was what she was explaining about um, somatic healing, which is working... There's a, a chap, a biologist, I think, or scientist, who's been looking at the effects of um, trauma in animals. And what he's discovered is that when animals have a traumatic experience, you know, you're that little mouse and, and you've just missed the owl, what they do is they shake and then they do two large breaths and, and, it, and it gets out of their body. That's how they deal with the, the, the trauma of, of, sort of near death. And humans are the only creatures that actually store it in their body. So a lot of work goes on with people you know, in, in trauma, but... So far, it seems that most of it has been about reliving that trauma, you know, going through the trauma mm. again, sort of thing. So, so there's a way um, that they're looking at in constellations of, or the somatic healing is a way of doing that without the person having to relive the trauma. Um, and there's a way, I think, they're just looking at it in ways of how you could then constellate aspects of that trauma and look at it, look at it in a different way without it being traumatic again. And then I was talking to another friend about this, um, you know, sort of extra spurt of energy I've had about it. And he was talking about, I think it was um, Indian esoteric Buddhism. And he was saying many, many sort of centuries ago, when the Buddhists were sort of, um, I think it was when, when they, they just kind of withdrew and became the Buddhist community because of the, the wars. And I'm not very good on the history bit of it, but... What they did was they used to set up these sort of um, constellatory type courts. So if there was something going on in the country, they would pick people to represent this faction or that judge or this judiciary, and they would um, see what came out of this sort of this uh, this people representing these different aspects. So it's not such a kind of new thing in a way and I'm, so that's an area that I want to sort of delve into a little bit and, and have a look at so that's it that's me yeah I'm, I'm really curious whether there might be some relationship between uh, the people that you're talking about in terms of particular kinds of trauma and the everyday experience that we have where for example relationships can break down and there's something in what you're saying that it might help us to have that um, relaxation or something with the boundaries that actually managed, like Nigel does. I think you've gone through tremendous um, tensions around responding to vulnerable children's needs. But at the same time, I think Nigel's managed to find that appropriate way yeah, of sustaining dialogue. But anyway, let's come back. Mm -hmm. We can come back to that. That'd be mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, great. I like your story. I think it's very much where we end up getting to because it's asking a question that isn't usually asked. There's a presupposition in the in all of that going down the chimney, coming up, how can he come out clean? What does he make what does it then mean that he wants to become clean? And then that jump where everybody else has to become the same as I think I am. 
So I like that story very much. I think that's one of my problems is I end up going to I'll become totally inarticulate then as to try and explain what it is I mean. And I think the same is for me, one of the tensions about this colloquium is that there's a lot of assumptions. What is academic? What is scholarly? What is personal development? Why the hell are these things separated off? So I was trying to get my head because at the moment all we have is that it's um, academic. If a few academics who are, have a job as an academic say it is academic, I would have thought it's academic if it is if there's a clear rational explanation. I think there's something about rationality for me about what is academic and the logic behind it. If it's scholarly, I've understood, is that it actually draws on the, the knowledge of others. It's not just about my own scholarship, but actually drawing on that knowledge. Isn't scholarship to do with knowledge, um, creating knowledge? And that notion of, well, um, again, it, it, it's a four star comes to me, I think, between personal development and professional development and creation of academic knowledge. And I think one of the things that really attracts me to the theory is it actually puts those together. That enables you to actually address, not simplistically, but there's an elegance about some things like that story. They sound really simple, but when you start to dig beneath them, which is what you find in China, it, it feels as though you're wading through mud. But I think it's because we are asking questions we don't usually ask. Things are always simple when you've done them, <laughs> but not in the process of doing them, and certainly not in the process of suddenly finding there's a question that haven't asked before, not really asked it in a way that is, is challenging. So it's, that I think is what I find interesting and uh, interesting to see what comes out of this conference where it actually does look at those unasked, those are unasked questions. I think it was yesterday um, afternoon, I think. Yeah. Today. I think I think there's something um, just from <coughs> you saying that there, Marie. It, it recalls something about um, a story on on academia, where a friend of mine who's he's um, he's got an amazing brain, and he's got this theory about I think it's I think it's Egyptian measurement. I can't really understand most of it, but he's taken this. Um, and he, he's been to Oxford and um, got hold of you know the right the, the right people to explain this theory. And what he has actually come away saying is they have got so much invested in what they've already produced and written that he said they're ossified. They're just not open to this because what I've got will blow all that out of the water. And I said, what are you going to do about it? He says, I haven't got time to worry about that. He says, I've got to get on doing you know my, my theory. If I can't get them. To if I if I can't go through their hoops, he said because it's just it's not going to happen because they've got so much invested they've got their point of view they've proven that point of view and therefore now their stance is not oh well that could happen that would be interesting it's no you prove it to me why 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 it's not going to happen so there's something about ossification I think. Well, when they're trying to think in it, Darwin had that sort of problem. <coughs> You know, the establishment was basically saying this is, this is rubbish. And he came up with a major theory um, that you know, it took ages for people to listen to. Um, I think because people are sort of fixed on this is, this is the reality for us and not necessarily open to, to new ideas. And they've invested so much in it. Oh, yeah. They? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. just about investment and motivation. I mean, I, I've got, I gave the example of the seminar in, in my life I've been to where they. The researchers didn't want to hear about the practice mm. and told us that we didn't need to look at the research because they'd looked and there was no evidence. Mm. Um, so they're, un, you know, they're, <coughs> oh my goodness, they've got an assistant, you know, they, they, their job title is they have an associates, um, but they actually live by doing research on behalf of other people. You made an interesting point though, it's, it's about academics, it's about the establishment. Mm. So just, you get the same from uh, practitioners. Oh, don't bother me with that. That's yeah, academic yeah. stuff. I yeah, yeah. can go there. Mm -hmm. You get the same as to who is an artist? An artist is somebody 
because they were an artist, or is it accepted by the establishment? So I think, again, we need to be really clear. Mm. And how do you change things? Yeah. Um, there's for somebody's project, somebody that you wait for them to die out, which they never do because those um, ideas are then continue to live through the next other people who have, and everybody's got an investment. Oh, the people who are uh, <coughs> flat earth, they had a, they'd invested something of themselves in those ideas, so they're not in some respects even being disingenuous, I think, and actually believed it is. Mm -hmm. so conflict, so is, that conflict is based on investment, isn't yeah. it? You know, mm -hmm. The whole kind of like how wars start and everything yeah. is about my idea versus your idea. Yeah. And also, you look at these great scientists who made these great breakthroughs, like Galileo, for example. I mean, that they were really sort of criticised at the time. You know, some people regarded heretics and yeah, because it's completely and against the establishment. And yeah, well, Socrates taught hemlock, you know, and then Galileo, I don't know if you ever read that, but he was shown the instruments of torture. Um, as if they were about to be used on him to get him to recant yeah. uh, what he knew to be true. Yeah. Um, but I'm just curious about one thing where um, Marie talked about that thing about, um, you know, and you were saying about, if you like, my mind paradigm, where um, there was a famous seminar in uh, about 1970, and it was on criticism of the growth of knowledge, okay, and this guy, Lakatos, has got this amazing phrase which shocked me when I read it, and uh, he was saying, look, the people who believe in the hardcore of a research paradigm, you're not going to change them by rational argument. Yeah? And that was that point where Marisa, he said, you've just got to wait for them to die off. Yeah? And it was a, a really shock for me, because I believed you, know, you could actually persuade people by rational argument. Now what I'm curious about as we're going around is that, given that this is true what we're saying, and that point about the academic and the practitioner now, you're so right about the academics distorting, you know, the knowledge of the practitioner to fit in with their own schemas. Now, why is it that Chris feels so vulnerable, as you did earlier, about the knowledge which actually Nigel recognised, your practical knowledge was superb, um, and this is what I'm puzzled about in terms of the knowledge that you have, for me, is that sense of academic when you start to explain your influence. You, you know, because all I think it means for us to be academic in what we're doing is to produce valid explanations of our influence. You know, that for me is what I mean by being an academic. Yet, there is something in us all, probably through our own socialisation, that, that has not valued that knowledge. You know, we've been taught to dismiss it. You know, maybe it's just right to say then that, I mean, I can certainly understand to be academic. I don't need to be yeah. long to a university to, to be able to do that. But then there's another bit, which is the, the, the established academia or the establishment, which we, in some ways, we feel we've got to, to satisfy that beast. No, um, but Chris, I think you were particularly, and, and it wasn't, there was a gender bias, I think, because you were very sensitive about, for example, using I in your masters. Now, last night, I went down to Salisbury to celebrate with Mark Potts the fact that he's going to graduate on Saturday. He's not going to his graduation at Bath Spa, but he's got his doctorate. Now, Steve Coombs, who's supervised Mark, and also supervising McCain, is going to take up head of department at the University of South Pacific in August. Now, Steve was explaining the struggle he'd had to get the first person in the title of Mark's PhD. And you'll see it's on their website, and the I is there in the title. Now, Steve was saying that the two people, very senior in the institution, had tried to persuade him to get Mark to take out the first person yep, from the title. Is this at Bath Spa? Yeah, this is Bath Spa. Now, actually, Chris was, I think, the first living theory masters to get through Bath Spa, <coughs> where the I was in the title. So it's this thing that you've actually done something very special and really significant. Nigel helped with that process, yet we still haven't <laughs> made public the influence that the space has had with Chris. And that's what I'm just curious about, whether we can... It's, it's, isn't it validation? We're all coming to, to you and this group in order to be part of the establishment, because otherwise I can shout from the rooftops and nobody will listen to me. Unless I am part of this establishment and doing it in the way that gets that validation, but there's no audience. Isn't that what it is? Yeah, no. You know, I agree with you. I spent, what, 40 years doing that in the academic context. 
but I didn't accept <coughs> the knowledge base. That was part of what I wanted, to transform the knowledge base. Now, this is what I think we're all doing. But to do it, we need your explanations of your influence. Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? Because we can get them accredited, which is part of joining the establishment in that sense. But we've got now a range of external examiners that will validate your knowledge. Now, that's one way of transforming. That's why Nigel's, I think, is so important to get the doctorate you know, uh, legitimated. So recognising that everybody has a contribution to make and their experiences at this point, I promise you what you're saying. Yeah, it is that your knowledge are in you, okay? Yeah. If we can just help you to make public mm -hmm. the values base, which for me, it, it, it's a relational, the qualities that you bring into mm -hmm. your relational understandings, and also there's an emotional sensitivity, I think, that Nigel is also really committed to in terms of vulnerable children. Mm -hmm. will help to transform the knowledge base. So we need to enable you to bring your knowledge that you've got, and it, it's vast in extent and depth. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Julie, when you, you work with organisations to bring that understanding, which nobody's done, you know, and it would help to transform what counts as valid knowledge. But you, you, there's a reticence, um, there's a humility, sometimes a vulnerability mm -hmm. and shyness, which seems to be getting in the way. Do you, and that, that, I think, is cultural, do you know? I suppose it's quite scary when you are laying out your, your sort of influences and your, your life and everything, and I suppose... And I, I, know, I know what Chris means, at this point in my life, probably I would have thought twice about sharing some of the things that I do share now, mm -hmm. but I think I've probably got to that stage where it all well, doesn't matter. Yeah, it is all. <coughs> no, it's that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, because for reasons I don't understand, no, mm -hmm. it may be a gender issue, you know, here, but... I really don't connect with that sense of vulnerability, do you? Mm -hmm. you know, because I want to shout your knowledge from the rooftops. You know, I want to say, look, it's absolutely fantastic. You know, and I've seen this Sheila, and everybody here has got this amazing understanding and sensitivity to what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm all the time seeing your humility and the sense of vulnerability, the shine. Do you, and, uh, but there's also sometimes for me, there's a sense of the the Groucho Marx thing of, well, I don't want to be a member of any club that will have me. <laughs> so there's a little bit of, oh, well, I don't know if I want to be in your club, you know, <laughs> in your academic club. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could leave me wrong. So I was say, from, from, from my perspective, it's that, that first person experience is really important and that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's the knowledge that I've, I've grown inside me, if you like, mm -hmm. for 40 years. Well, for 60 years, but you know, whatever. Um, and you then, uh, just an example, um, I was asked to do a piece of work in Torbay around a difficult case where the parent was falling out with um, uh, the local authority in the school and helping and all this sort of thing. Um, now, if I look at it from the outside and so say I'm going to write this up as a, as a case study, you know, you'd be then saying, well, the researcher, well, you know, this person did this and did this and did this. I went to a so I can do all that, and I wrote a report, and it was all sort of logical and the evidence based and so on. You go to a meeting, and immediately the tensions in the room between the parent and the school and so on. And, and it's in that moment when I'm actually drawing on all that experience and being able to spin those plates and, and just a quick look at that and say, right, fine. You know, I don't know how, I mean, part of the problem is capturing all yeah. that because you're yeah. doing it at the same time. Yeah. But it is valid knowledge, and it's not that I need to go back and look at the book and say, how would, how would somebody react in this situation? Well, yes, you could probably do that, you know, you can even say with the chemical reactions and, you know, the synapses and things, you know, <laughs> and all those things going on. It was, actually, I'm on my toes here doing yeah, it. Yeah. That is really valid knowledge. Um, the hard bit is actually capturing it. Yeah, and that's, that comes with my question about how you manage to do it, you know, mm -hmm. how is it, and, and that sort of um, um, explanation. Um, but I, I said to Sheila as well, you know, that um, in a way, like when I put the paper out and, and so on, that I was either feeling that thing about vulnerability, I, I felt, because um, you said something, Sheila, about you would be worried about being judged. I was worried about being mm -hmm. judged. But I think, you know, I don't know if it's a bit of bravery or a bit of madness or a bit of both. <laughs> you know, I just did it. But I think the thing is, like, if I do it and then I see that other 
people do it as well. Yes. You kind of enable that, you know, sometimes it's like, well, I don't mind being silly, you know. <laughs> but then actually you allow everybody to be, this is not silly, but you know, it's just, if you think it's not good enough or, you know, it's a start, then you enable other people. But I think that gives you that sort of energy to actually mm -hmm. say, hang on a second, because, you know, I'm sharing something. Mm -hmm. And that if that enables other people sharing something, mm -hmm. then maybe we can build the knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think there are things that you, you, in some ways, have to get over when it is that actually I might be, be um, seen as a charlatan or you know uh, this is this is rubbish. And it's a bit that I don't I don't want to be that vulnerable. You know, I don't want people to criticise me. I want want to all think nicely of me and say nice things about me. But there's another bit that she says I want to invite. I'm going to go out and invite that comment. And if somebody says well I'm not quite happy, please tell me more yeah, exactly. about it. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, because that is part of I want to learn. From this, and and it's sort of pushing that vulnerability, or making that vulnerability a positive, if you yeah, like. Yeah. Um, but that is hard to do, um, mm -hmm. you know, particularly if you have been brought up being perfect and mm -hmm. you're not allowed to get things wrong. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I know when I did my masters at Glass Bar and when I was in dissertation, um, I used to feel like a five-year-old going up to. It yeah. felt like going to teach it. Really did. And I used to get myself into right state. And it was only afterwards that I could look back and I think I did feel like a child who was going to be criticised um, and yeah I think you know it's the sort of teacher's child even though I was a grown up I, I think I did regress a little bit. I, I did um, mine, I was the first year of masters at Newton Park yeah. and they didn't know what the hell they were doing so it was pretty hard going on, actually your life was part of that position yeah. um, but I didn't have it, it wasn't personal to work. Um, but, um, um, but um, and I used to go home and cry because mm -hmm. I didn't know what the words were, um, and uh, and there was no. It was just like they they started a particular place, you know. Right, we're all here, and they started, and you know all those words that are still empirical and what that sound like the Queen Empire, you know. And I just used to kind of quietly write it in the back of my book and go home, burst into tears, and then look it up in a dictionary because this is before mm -hmm. Google days. Um, but that was huge, and it took me five years to get my masters, and two tutors who just didn't know what to do with me. You know, um, but uh, it was it was really hard going, and there was just and I there was no way I would ever say I don't know what you mean because I just felt so completely inadequate and I shouldn't be there because I didn't know. But I think that's exactly you know kind of when I'm trying to develop the learning culture of the organisation where I work with. That's exactly what I want to get rid of mm. that fear. You know, mm. that people are afraid of, you know, so what? So what if you said something and it's wrong or whatever, you know? It's just like, well, let's discuss it. And, you know, the I mean, climate. Exactly. It's about the climate, exactly. isn't it? And there yes. was no climate. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, no, I'm not criticizing. I'm, I'm, I'm sure half the people, people went home and cried and yeah. found out what more I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I, I, think, that. I think that's one of the things. I, I usually am the person who stands up and asks the silly question, and everybody, ooh. <laughs> you know? But actually, what you realize is that half of the people, at least, would have asked the same question if they had a, you know, if they had the, the... That was the basis of that little book I Yes. Yeah. You know, why I came up with it, but basically, smart people don't get it, yeah. type of thing, because they would not, you know, admit that they don't know, if you like. Yeah. And you've got to start saying, I, I, I need to know more about it. I think, I think that's where perhaps, you know, if you do start making yourself more vulnerable and saying, actually, I don't know, this, but I suppose it does set the scene for others mm -hmm. to say, hey, well, actually, if, if that person doesn't know, maybe it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's creating that safe place to actually say. Mm -hmm. it's Something also about, you know, the, the organisation or, or the learning organisation having or developing their muscles of, of you know, positive, just positive regard for people, yeah. isn't it? It's, it's about expecting them to be doing exactly what you're doing and not and not judging and, and listening, really listening properly. All those sort of things come into creating the conditions for this sort of thing and, to flourish. And, just, and what you're saying, I think, and it, it sparked in me, is about status. And when Jack was talking, I was just thinking, you know, nobody invites <coughs> me to go to Mauritius to talk about what I've done. And I'm just thinking about where you are and where I am. And, and a question, I remember when I joined this group, I was in a job that I absolutely hated. And I'd gone freelance, hadn't made enough money, so I jumped into a job. And I think the first round was, you know, and, you know, what, you know, to say, tell us a little bit about what you do. And I couldn't, I was ashamed. And that's the point where I realised for the first only time in my life I resigned the job. But 
even with Jo Walton, she emailed me back and she said, can you tell me what you, what you do to go on this website? And I just thought, I'm a community development worker and that sounds like crap. And I wanted to say, you know, I was an educationalist, I was, I was an advisor, I was, a, you know, I worked for the Home Office job. And all this stuff rose up in me as I don't want to put CDW down because it's a lonely little job, you know. And then I just thought, that's it. But that went through my mind. They're not going to take any notice of this because I'm a CDW. Yeah, yeah, go on. Go on. Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of thinking, it's, it's interesting because, you know, being like the head of service, you've got the other thing, and it's the other thing about status. Is you have maybe some status, but then actually people don't tell you stuff because they, yeah. you know. And actually, for me, is how you create. And and you know, I, I'm actually quite open, and most people, you know, and it's I have achieved a lot, but I'm not quite happy with what, <laughs> what, what where I am. But um, is that thing about so how do you know actually what's going on on the ground? Because again, people are afraid of um, open up to their own mistakes or their mm -hmm. own vulnerabilities, and you know, it's actually. I, I'm there to really support and, and try to help and improve things, and you cannot do that unless there is that, you know, so the status, well, you know, it's just kind of how you break through that, so that actually people, okay, you've got a different level of responsibilities, etc., and you're leading, but, you know, you are one of them too, and you kind of need to work together to do that, and that's, you know, how you... can have a conversation for an hour in a pub. And then someone says, what do you do? And I'm a psychologist. It kills the conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can make my money. Yeah. Yeah. I, used, I used to be a drugs advisor. And that was fantastic. You'd get <laughs> hours and hours and hours. Yeah. Just, you'd stop saying it because you couldn't How much can I drink? Now, can I drink yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can make myself yeah. a new rock. Um, and I'd usually start with saying, I'm into drugs. And that would be a good thing. <laughs> um, but, but now I work with older people. And off they go. You know, it's like actually I'm doing now so much more exciting than being a drugs advisor. You know, just, community you know, development. I mean, that's fantastic. You know, it's a huge. It's a huge thing to be able to do. Develop but but I, I think maybe it's because I'm, I'm my own standards. Judgments are made about you know among professionals about you know kind of state, you know what qualifications you need about what's the pay you get you know da 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 da. And then CDW. Maybe I always looked down on a CDW until I was one. Um, you know, because they're not, you know, you don't have to be a professional, you can be anybody, you know, etc, etc. So it's, it's, it's living with your, I mean, you know, my big thing's labels, you know, it's living with your label and being comfortable with it. And, and I feel I am, until something like that brings me up short and I think, I haven't learned much, have I? I don't want it to go on the website, don't you? Um, yeah, and I just, I want to say there was another Radio 4 programme on, which just had a single, it was fascinating. I didn't hear the beginning because I'm always listening to programmes when I'm driving and I don't hear the beginnings. Um, and it was about somebody who's lost their, their memory for the last whatever years, oh, and they aren't going to gain it. That, yeah. um, and there was just something that was said by who, and I must re-look at it, um, was that um, you can't have an identity without memory. Mm. And it, it just sparked so much in my head, because what we're talking about is what we knew before that's causing conflict mm. or, or difficulties or insecurity. And I'm absolutely fascinated to look further into this idea about it's, it's if we could just get, and it's about you, it's the letting go of trauma, mm -hmm. you know, if we could just let go of the memories that were negative or, or the memories that, that spark something mm -hmm. in us. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's actually, it relates a bit, because you said something about the, the research being mindful, and I, I'm doing this mindful um, mindfulness course, and actually relates a bit to what you were saying as well, Julie, because one of the um, techniques that we're um, learning to do is really kind of embracing kind of um, our feelings and what, you know, the tensions at the moment, and then breathe for about three times and kind of think, where am I now? Am I in danger? Because exactly of that, that mm -hmm. affects a lot, isn't it? That, you know, we have all these bad memories and so on that we worry us about being judged and, and so on. But actually now, are we, you know, in danger? Or, or whatever, and breaking that sort of mm -hmm. cycle exactly. Mm -hmm. So it kind of made me think about that, yeah, it, it's being, forget, all the past. I think mean, use that knowledge, obviously, that you acquired through the years, but forget the bad experiences. See where you're now, and sort of, um, yeah, that will influence where you're going next. Yeah, and I'm just wondering whether we could uh, work with that because uh, with Sonia, Sonia's got this amazing data of where she presented at ARA and a videoed, and then we've got her paper, and the difference in what is being communicated is really dramatic. Yeah? Now. What I'm wondering is, when you talk about oh, the forgetting, 
Okay, so we could actually start um, on a different basis to your vulnerability, if you, mm. you know, or that sense of your history. Um, if we're looking at the kind of knowledge that we've all got, and it's all different, it's all unique, but what I'd love us to do, if you would, is, um, I've got the head of the Moffat Institute in Israel, she's a woman called Mikhail Goblin, and I've got this 16-minute video of me uh, in conversation with her two weeks ago. And I've given uh, Marie the book that's just been published from the Moffat Institute, which is one of the um, most significant ones in terms of an international gathering of contributors. But it's like with Sonia, when you look at Mikhail talking with me, I'm curious about whether you also feel that she starts, for example, about the importance of dialogue. There's nothing about dialogue in this book. And when you look at her body language, she also talks to me about the importance of attending. Just attending to the other. Now actually, I, I videotaped um, you all as Marie was speaking. And I think you will also see yourselves giving Marie attention, really attending to what she was saying. And I'm just wondering, if you look at Mikhail, and then look at yourselves from today, whether you could almost forget that vulnerability and just feel the enormous energy and the knowledge that you have, which we could then really work out making public. Because you'll, if you just listen to today's, I, I think you'll all get a sense that we're describing things which, if you like, we're all understanding and agreeing with. But you ask the question, well, how do I do it? You know, how, how do I do it? And if we focus on that question, what are we doing? You know, like with your values, and that has, and now you're no longer, it seems, you know, worried about mm -hmm. um, talking about the values and showing us, you know, you're living them. I think we'll get a tremendous long way in terms of making this knowledge public, but am I making sense here that there's something, a transformation that you're, uh, that was lovely, that sense of, okay, let, can you get out of that history that's been on your shoulders for years? Recognise the enormous value of the knowledge that you've got. So when you talk about status, um, yeah, that I've got a certain kind of, if you like, international status. Now, actually, that has come, in one sense, through, through arrogance of seeing that the knowledge I had as a classroom teacher was actually far superior to the knowledge of the key professors who were telling me what educational theory was and totally eliminating my knowledge as a teacher. Now, from that base of conviction, all I've done is make that knowledge public and get it all over the place because it seems to me that we, we could share the knowledge we've got and influence what counts as legitimate knowledge. But I think it requires what you've just said. I forget, you know, getting rid of those things, then looking at yourselves, and it, this is vital, you know, as you were speaking to me, that you'll see yourselves on the tape. There is a real conviction about the values that you're expressing and what you're talking about. And that's where I think it would be great to start with that and then say, well, look, you know, this is me now. Here is what I've done. Can I make it public? And I think, you know, I'd love to just help with that process. Is self-belief? Is that what you're saying? Very, very strong. <laughs> a very strong, and it's called ontological security. You know, I don't want to... Ontological. In a, Paul Tillich, the, I think a Catholic theologian, in The Courage to Be, had this lovely notion of what he called ontological despair, where life has no meaning. Yeah. But the opposite of that was ontological security. Okay, now, as she was speaking, in fact, as you were all speaking about what you value, you're communicating what I understand by ontological security. It's, it's a real conviction, in, and it's not an arrogance, it is a belief in self, in the sense of the values that you hold, and you really do understand that these give meaning and purpose to your life. Now, starting with that, you, which you'll see yourselves on the video, I think, expressing something that everybody else is recognising as your ontological security. Now, if we can just work with this and then get your narratives and share them, um, you know, kind of, that status, you know, which comes out from people attending to you and paying attention to it, will come. <laughs> but we've got to get your stories. Paul Tillich, it's a lovely term. T I -L, -L, L I C H. T I L L I C H. And I think it was in the 1950s, his book called The Courage to Be. The Courage to Be. Yeah, and it, it is a lovely um, text. But if you just look up uh, what he's actually saying about ontological security, just read that section. And I think you'll all feel it as you see yourselves. 
And as soon as the spotlight's on you, it's almost like the thing on your shoulder, it takes you back into that sense of the vulnerability, the being judged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but that is based on it again, the memories, isn't it, and the kind of past experience, because I'm, you know, um, I'm not against first person research either, and I think that I suppose it's a bit of what Marie was saying, that these things need to bring together, there is a sort of rule for everything, and sometimes I feel that it's useful for me as a practitioner to have someone from outside looking and getting a different angle and maybe having seen different practitioners with different um, angles or, or something like that. But I think the problem is, is, like, is that thing about establishment and then what is uh, recognised and how is measured, which is a bit what um, Nigel was talking about. Um, I, one of the things I'm indeed editor of board of um, the journal, um, anyway, I have to write three articles. I mean, the amount of ones that I rejected, very simply, these people seem, you know, they've got a target to meet, I don't know, to publish, I don't know, many papers or whatever. And I think that's the problem a bit, you know, that these people have an invested interest and have a sort of establishment to please or, or something like that. And that's how things are recognised. But some of the staff, I mean, I think, you know, really, you know, it's not, and, and I think it's that thing about it has to be meaning. Um, it has to um, make sense to, to practitioners. It needs to be a valid knowledge, and that it doesn't matter if it's third person or first person, they're equally valid. But I think at, at the moment, you know, there's this thing that they're really not. No, they're not. But this week, and then, uh, can I, can I, can I, can I finish? Yes? Okay. Yes. That's good. Yeah.